this is a segment that's going to be discussing uh, how to construct a lineup. And it's a big weekend here. This is the weekend that uh, Operation Sports Full Minor roster was released. And uh, there's at least an addition or possibly even two out at this point um, for that. So I know a lot of folks are excited. They've been waiting for this. And uh, as I've been even seeing on Twitter today, this is uh, kind of being coined as now the real opening day is starting. And so one of the pieces that I wanted to talk about with everyone was now that you have these rosters and you have the game and you've been playing it a little bit and you're ready to jump into your franchise is how do you construct a lineup? And there are a lot of ways to answer that question. Uh, and there are many different kind of schools of thought on that. And what I wanted to do is actually talk about a couple different school of thoughts on constructing lineups, uh, which is more of the traditional lineup structure versus more of a sabermetric uh, lineup structure. And uh, as we go through and discuss these, especially with sabermetrics, um, I'll be discussing sort of what those terms are, uh, what they mean, why they're potentially important. And again, this isn't necessarily a debate I'm trying to have or to necessarily pick a side. Um, but it's to at least sort of explain that because maybe these are terms that you've heard of. I mean, some of you may be young enough to say, well, what the heck is a traditional lineup? What does that even mean? So uh, this is really geared to try and explain what those two are, how they can apply to a game. And because, yes, even in a video game, whether it's setting a lineup or setting your pitching staff, it does have an effect. Uh, and it will potentially matter, of course, uh, if, as you're playing or simulating through a 162 game season, there are ways to do this. So let's do this. I have set up with my, I'm starting a franchise with the Miami Marlins. I wanted to take this team because they're actually one of two teams in real life who don't have a general manager. Uh, so I figured on opening day, uh, that'd be kind of a fun little challenge to kind of step into that role that probably nobody really wants uh, because of the turmoil that team's in. The other team being the Boston Red Sox, although Dave Dombrowski, their president, uh, is obviously kind of pulling a lot of strings there. And I didn't see that team as, as too much of a challenge to really take. Um, so I like the Marlins. They're kind of a fun team. They're sort of a middle of the road. I think they're ranked like 14th or 15th with the uh, OSFM 1.0 rosters. And uh, that's the roster I'm using here. A few tweaks. I did add in a couple prospects on my Tigers that were missing, Joe, Joe, Jimenez, or Joe Jimenez, Bo Burrows, um, things like that. And then this is a roster that was set up uh, as a 40-man roster. So I, I wish I remembered the person who did that. Uh, it was on Operation Sports Forum. So thank you for putting that together last night. That's the roster I'm using because I know some people will want to ask about that. Anyway, so I'm taking my Marlins, and what I've done is I have set up a sort of a traditional lineup here with the uh, DH lineup. I'm going to be looking at just kind of the right side of the plate right now, right-handed pitching. Uh, as we are facing right-handed pitching, here's what a traditional lineup would be. Uh, so you can ignore the nine spot. I just put Ichiro there, so just – Pretend that's the pitcher, right? Um, and then we have sort of a more of a, uh, of a sabermetric lineup here with the uh, uh, the no DH lineup. But let's start with traditional, right? Traditional lineups are going to say a couple things that are extremely different, and most of them are happening really in these first three batter spots. Um, after that, it starts to get pretty similar as you go down. Probably the biggest difference, uh, one of the biggest differences, is going to come in the the number one spot. I just realized I'm like totally flushed out by the sun. Uh, the leadoff spot in a traditional lineup sounds like this. Someone with speed who can steal bases and hopefully get on base. Now, that's fine and dandy. Uh, no one's going to complain, I guess, about having someone with a little bit of speed. But sabermetrics, kind of that, that study of baseball efficiency, right, and actually trying to back up arguments with statistics is going to tell you, well, I don't care how fast you are. If you can't get on base, you're useless, Right. The other part of that where sabermetrics will kind of argue and say, no, don't put your speedy guy here, is even if he is a guy who can get on base, right? Do you really want to risk stealing when you have your best hitters coming up? Don't you? Isn't the whole idea to hit two, three, even grand slams, right? Two, three uh, run home runs. If you have that guy on base getting thrown out, now your best hitters are going to be coming up and there's no one on base in front of them. So solo shots, obviously. Uh, you're not going to get too many guys over the 100 RBI mark in a season if they're hitting a bunch of solo home runs. So uh, that is one of the biggest differences. So Sabermetrics, on the other hand, will tell you to take D. Gordon and bat him sixth. And the reason is this. He's fast and he can steal bases, sure. Uh, but D. Gordon is not a big on-base percentage guy, right? He's a guy who makes great contact. You can see his ratings are good. But look at his discipline rating of 36. Uh, even the best hitters, folks, are hitting 300, right? Um, and D. Gordon has only hit 300, uh, looks like a couple times in his career. And so 
uh, when you, you know what, let me, yeah, I was going to turn off the video so you can see the stats here. But anyway, um, the on-base percentage is going to be the most important part if you're really looking for a sabermetric leadoff. Now, last year he had a 359, and that's great, but that's the only year he's really had a number above 350. And sort of 350 is sort of that threshold you want to look for in an on-base guy uh, for your leadoff hitter. His career, 325. Um, again, it's a little bit low. And so um, he's not an ideal leadoff guy. I, I know a lot of people will think this. be like, oh, he's so fast when he can bunt for hits. But, folks, even doing that, uh, you know, maybe if you bunt for hit with this guy, you could bring up his on-base percentage a little bit. But he's not going to hit his way to 350. He's just not. Um, speaking of Ichiro, I mean, what is Ichiro's best season? Uh, where's he at here? Ichiro is a guy who never walks either, right? But he's got high on base percentage because he puts the such high contact. But again, he's only hit 350 a couple times in his career, three times, right? Four times. This is a Hall of Famer, guys. Uh, so you can't just expect some dude to come in, even if he's a good player like D. Gordon, and get on base 35% of the time. So he's better actually batting in the sixth spot. And by batting in the sixth spot, you can start to utilize his speed because now you can start putting your hitters that aren't necessarily your best hitters, um, kind of your what's left over guys, right, uh, who can just drive him in with a single because just about any major league baseball player can hope to get a single here and there uh, during a game. So if D. Gordon can get on base, if he can steal, you just need one of these two guys to drive him in here uh, before the pitcher spot comes up. And actually, really, I forgot to change that. The uh, sabermetric lineup would actually look more like that. And I'll explain why there in a second. So, um, so D. Gordon, again, the idea here is that you'd want him to steal so Martin Prado can drive him in. So that's the big difference there. Now, traditional lineup for the two-hole, they want somebody who's good with the bat, right? They want someone who's a good bunter, maybe, um, someone who's going to make contact. Now, Prado is not a good bunter. The uh, uh, Marlins don't really have kind of that traditional number two hitter on this team. But I put him up here because he is a guy uh, who can make good contact. He's got good vision. He'll put that ball in play. But here's the thing, though. Martin Prado, if he puts the ball in play, he's, he's a career 293 hitter. That's nice, right? But still, folks, on a ball that's put in play, 7 out of 10 times on a ball that's put in play, it's going to be an out, right? And that's on the ground. So 7 out of 10 times, you potentially could be hitting into a double play. So having someone here who's good with the bat, I don't know if that's going to be the, the best solution. Now, it's a little bit different, maybe, because maybe you could say, well, if D. Gordon's on base, I could steal with him, and it's sort of that same setup versus 6 and 7. That's fine, but do you want these guys coming up more often, or do you want your better hitters coming up more often? So that's kind of the argument that would uh, go along with that. So anyway, Prado, not a bad player. In a sabermetric lineup, though, we would be kind of keeping that combo together, sort of a guy with the, who's good with the bat. But I don't want him batting second. I want my better hitters coming up more often in the game. So Prado would bat seven. Now, one of the bigger differences, again, with traditional lineup versus sabermetric lineup is I'm going to call uh, Giancarlo Stanton here our best hitter, right? If I look, uh, he had a down year last year. He only hit 240. Um, he still hit 27 homers. But it was a bit of a down year compared to the last few years he's had. But he's still the best hitter on the team. Um, you can make an argument for Yelich, uh, Yelich I should say. But uh, Stanton, we're going to just for this discussion here, we're going to say he's the best hitter on the team. Your traditional line would say bat this guy third. Get him up third. A sabermetric lineup is going to say bat him fourth. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a second. I thought we wanted to get our best hitters more at bats. Uh, and, and that is true. And I'll, I'll talk about that a lot with the number two spot here with the sabermetric lineup. But the idea is you want to get guys on base in front of him. You want to give yourself as many opportunities as you can. So if you, if you take the first inning, for instance, right, if one of these guys can get on base, which almost, I mean, you're sort of expecting that, right? In the first inning, one of these guys, now he's up with a guy on base, right? And he's able to hopefully uh, use his power to either hit a double to drive men, hit a home run to drive men, and then, of course, that continues on. So a big difference there, three versus four. Um, your three hitter in a sabermetric lineup is actually uh, your fifth best hitter is what the, the numbers say. And again, when I say the numbers, I'm vaguely speaking of when, when they run the numbers, when they run the tests, and this is kind of going back over, um, you know, 150 years of baseball. They're showing the sabermetric people and, and the studies that they've done will show you that your fifth best hitter would be your three hitter. And so that's why in this lineup, I have Marcelo Zuna, uh, a nice player, um, but he's just kind of a guy we can sandwich in between our two best hitters. Because sabermetrics will tell you 
your second best hitter after Stanton in the cleanup spot would be your number two hitter. And that is probably the biggest difference between a sabermetric uh, lineup and a traditional lineup is that it's the difference in the two hole. Basically, you're putting your second best player here in the two hole in a sabermetric lineup. In a traditional lineup, you're putting the guy who can swing the stick, uh, who can handle a bat, who's a good bunter and this sort of thing. Saver metrics, the basic principle, again, in a perfect world, traditional lineup, Prado would be a good bunter. But Saver metrics says the most important thing is outs. You cannot trade outs for anything under no circumstances unless maybe it's a tie game in the ninth or extra innings and you're the home team. Other than that, it has been proven, at least uh, according to Saver metrics, that it is not the most efficient use of your players by bunting, right? And so by putting Yelich here, again, the idea is that you're getting him more at bats, and it actually ties into the reason why some of these teams are now batting their pitchers eighth, because we can sort of create that sort of old-fashioned three-hitter by having our eighth best hitter actually batting ninth so that he could get some more opportunities or we could get some more opportunities to put uh, base runners in front of Yelich. Uh, Yelich, I keep saying his name wrong, who can uh, hopefully drive those guys in. Um, because again, there's only uh, he's only batting second one time, right? And that's that's the first inning. Uh, so as the game goes on, we want to try to get him guys in front of him. And that's the exact same reason why Stanton bats fourth, not third in a sabermetric lineup, right? Uh, the fifth hitter is pretty similar in a traditional lineup. Usually this is, um, there, there's a couple schools of thought in a traditional. Some people will kind of put it's almost like their second cleanup hitter. Uh, another like basher guy, but a lot of teams will put kind of their, their second best contact hitter, like another almost like a leadoff, because ideally your cleanup hitter has now come in and maybe, you know, has driven the runs in uh, or the innings over, that sort of thing. And so you're kind of starting off the next inning with potentially your, your five hitter. So a sabermetric lineup, though, um, is very, they put a lot of emphasis on that sort of second cleanup hitter. They, they want this. This is one of your best three or four hitters, probably three. Uh, if this is your best on base guy, this is your best hitter. This is your second best. You're putting your third best hitter in the five spot, right? And so against righties, at least Justin Bohr would be this guy. And then that, of course, brings us to um, we're going to call Real Muto our our uh, our fourth best hitter, and then Ozuna would be the fifth, and he would go here, right? And then it goes into Gordon, as I mentioned, your best base dealer, and then after that is pretty much your seventh best hitter. Your eighth best hitter would go here. And and those two last two spots are pretty much exactly the same. Remember, we're ignoring Suzuki. He's kind of my stand-in pitcher. Um, but he uh, uh, these, these guys would be at the bottom of the lineup. I put Real Muto as my leadoff because, really, I don't have a huge on-base guy. The guys who are are my best hitters, and I don't want them batting leadoff um, because I want guys on base in front of them. Uh, but Real Muto uh, is probably our, really our best option at this point. Um, but again, it's really just kind of based on his numbers from last year. If I scroll over, uh, he had an on base of 343. That's about as close as I can get. Um, he's not one of our huge boppers, right? He had 11 home runs and 500 at bat. So, you know, he's maybe a 15 home run a year guy. And that's a nice thing to have in a leadoff spot. But you can see the two years before that. I mean, his career on base is 317. So we'll see if, if he can keep that up. But uh, really, there's not an ideal. Um, guy for a sabermetric leadoff, at least with uh, the Marlins here. One of the other stats that I look for, um, that's another sabermetric stat, is I really like this base on ball percentage. I find it very efficient, and uh, sabermetrics will back this up, and so I guess uh, I could say the reverse of this. The sabermetrics has told me how effective this is, but looking for a base on ball percentage that's 10% or higher. Now, not a lot of guys have this. I, I think there's only a few on the team who may um, but basically that, that's one in every 10 at bats, one every two games or so they're getting on base with a walk, right? It's, it's free on base. I mean, it, on base percentage is the most powerful statistic, statistic in baseball. Um, if you have a team of high on base percentage and you're limiting the on base percentage of your opponents, you will be a good team if you're consistently doing that. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. So, um, so yeah, uh, Christian Yellick. It's pretty close there. He has a career. You can see it's over 10.4%. Um, that's pretty good. Um, Stanton is there as well. Um, he's a, He has that actual badge about drawing uh, bases on balls. So he's always been kind of at that percentage uh, for his career, which is good. 
But again, D. Gordon, right? Kind of that prototype leadoff hitter that a lot of people are probably thinking he is. And I like D. Gordon, but I don't want to bet in leadoff. His he's below a five percent for his career. So again, you have to hit your way on base with this guy. And folks, the best players in baseball only get on base, you know, twenty eight percent of the time uh, by hitting that way, or, or, or three hundred if, if you're you know really good. Um, that's not a good percentage. I would much rather find someone who's at that thirty five percent. That's that's a big increase doesn't sound like it but it is right uh you know 80 percentile points basically uh, above or i should say uh, 70 that's a huge increase and and you get those by getting kind of those free passes right so it's a very very powerful thing uh, but really i think those are probably the only guys on the team that have that high maybe four does i don't think he did i think he's in the sevens i don't know yeah so he's pretty close so justin Bohr, another guy uh, so those are really uh, a really nice thing to see. Now, again, you, you kind of get some free players like Anitro. He has a very low base on ball percentage. But, folks, he's one of the greatest hitters of all time. Um, he's at a 6%. Even last year, saw a nice increase there. Um, you know, so this is not something, uh, you know, there are players who can come in and, and still have a very nice career. The guy's 43 and he can still hit, right? Um, but, again, ideally, you want to keep that on base percentage nice and high. So, as far as other sabermetric stats to look at, now again, traditional stats, I, I won't spend a ton of time talking about. When we talk about traditional stats, we're, we're talking about batting average, um, probably slugging percentage. Um, on base has always been recorded, but again, it wasn't a huge focus until, uh, I guess, more recently in baseball history. Um, you know, RBIs was always a really, really big thing uh, that people focused on. But hey, you can only have RBIs if there's guys on base in front of you. So uh, the, the book of Sabermetrics will, will tell you that RBIs is really, it, it's not a very good measure of a player's skill um, because uh, he can't control that, right? He, he has to be on a good team if he's going to start racking up uh, a bunch of RBIs and so, um, or be very, very lucky or a little bit of both. So those are, um, you know, just a couple variables of, of why that's a stat that really it doesn't make a darn difference. Um, as a fan, it's nice to see, right? You like seeing those, but um, not a huge issue. So um, let's see. Looking at just kind of a combo of traditional stats. Of course, war. I'm assuming most folks know what war is. Wins above replacement player. What that number basically is, it's, it's a number that accumulates over the season. Um, so this is like 2.5. I bet you he didn't have a ton of at-bats that year. Um, because you have to actually, yeah, so he only had 240. It, it's it's a cumulative stat. Um, it's not something that you just kind of average or anything like that. It literally adds up as you go. Um, but where to go? But war is basically how many wins does Christian Yelich, uh, Yelich add to your team for that particular season? Or how many did he add? And so 5.8 wins, that's a lot, right? I mean, that is a heck of a lot. Uh, zero is kind of the level of, well, we don't want to pay this guy, you know, what is his contract, you know, 9 million, 10 million or so. Uh, if we can get a replacement player in there for like the league minimum or maybe a million or two, uh, and, and still stick around that war of a zero, um, the team's getting better off to do that. So it's a really nice measure to know, like, can we replace this guy? Uh, war does measure, um, offense and I believe defense too, right? I think that's the one that does measure defense as well. Uh, so it's literally how many wins did he contribute? Uh, person who's hurt, that number's going to be lower. So you do want to kind of look at the players at bats to make sure that it is accurate or at least giving you kind of the picture that you're imagining. Um, base on balls over Ks is another really cool stat that I like. Uh, it kind of goes in hand with that base on ball percentage. Um, you know, if we look at his season here, and if we look at the number of strikeouts and walks he had, he had 138 strikeouts and he had 72 walks, right? So basically, strikeouts over walks will give us uh, this base on ball over K percentage, right? Or I should say the other way around, right? Obviously, base on ball is divided by uh, K. So, um, if you get a guy who is, you know, close to one, that's that's pretty extraordinary. Like, I bet you, uh, I have not looked at Ichiro, but I bet you he's probably one of those rare guys, or maybe like a Victor Martinez is probably close to a one. Um, yeah, so even he, I mean, he's point, you know, point seven, it's pretty close, point seven eight. So he's had some, there's one. So he had, he had a year where he was above one. So I mean, that, folks, that's crazy, right? He 
was walking more than he struck out. And that's pretty remarkable. And again, that's not like putting the ball in play more than he struck out. That's walking, drawing walks more than he struck out. Um, I don't know if Victor Martinez would be or not, because he doesn't walk a ton. Uh, so anyway, that's an interesting stat. Let's look at uh, Giancarlo Stanton. And we'll keep looking at some more stats here. Um, ISO is an interesting uh, sabermetric stat. It's a really simple equation. It is just, I have to think now, it's slugging percentage minus batting average. And so the idea is that you're just kind of looking at, at, at just a player's power, right? Um, so these numbers can sometimes look low, but keep in mind that they're they're subtracting batting average, right? So that's why they kind of, they seem low. But the idea is, is it shows you um, a player's kind of just true power. Um, FS per home runs is pretty obvious. Um, looking at some of the other ones that, uh, um, runs created is obviously a, a really important stat. I mean, how many, if you had, a um, you know, runs created, uh, is, is this a cumulative stat? I think it is right. Um, runs created is, yeah, just whether they scoring runs or driving in runs, that sort of thing. Um, they're better prototype basically for that season how many runs are they contributing uh, to the team I think that's runs scored right so it'd be like literally runs scored not just not I don't think it measures RBIs at all um, range factor is a defensive uh, measure I, to be honest it's a little tricky to read without some of the other like um, zone rating um, defensive efficiency they don't have those stats in this game so it's hard to really get a true uh, feel for that statistic defensively, but that, that is a defensive metric. Um, I was trying to see if there's anything we can really draw out of that. Yeah, because even like runs saved, things like that, they would usually have for defense. So again, we get some of the saver metric stats, which is nice, but we don't get, um, you know, we don't get a ton of them, so. Uh, let's see. So let's look at pitching staff, pitching staff. Uh, by the way, another saver metric thing about building a lineup, I'll talk about bench really quick because of course the lineup's important, but one of the big, uh, kind of the big areas of, of focus for a saver metrics team build is having platoon players. And, and you'll see there's, you know, guys who have that actual badge. I think, uh, Dietrich might, nope. Um, but there are guys who have that platoon badge and it's sort of a perfect setup because, Again, you want to put yourself in the best position to win. And if you have some left-handed hitters who can come in and, and just play against righties or, or righties who can just bat against left-handed pitching on those rare times that it comes up, that's a huge advantage versus having those you know lefty bats in the lineup who may struggle um, against lefty pitching. So uh, you can give yourself a nice advantage there by carrying those guys on your bench. And the same thing in, in games even when a righty starts is when they go to their bullpen – you can have those guys come in and pinch hit, especially with a National League team when you're going to have pinch hitters in every single game, more or less, uh, when you're pinch hitting later for your, your pitcher. So uh, just a little note there on the bench. If we go in and look at the pitching rotation, right? Uh, your starting rotation, there's not really a huge difference. I mean, there's a lot of differences we could talk about in like, well, what are we looking for in a quality pitcher? And I'm going to get to those stats in just a minute. But really, I mean, of course, you want your best pitchers starting the game. You want them pitching as long as possible. Uh, and, and there's a lot of gray area with that lately about how long is the best, uh, I believe, a pitcher in. Uh, pitch counts continue to trend down. And MLB The Show 17 seems to even have a pretty strong focus, perhaps even too much this year, uh, on really limiting um, pitcher wear and tear uh, throughout the season. So uh, the Marlins, we don't have a great pitching staff. I'd actually say the pitcher I'm most excited about is Adam Conley. So let's just take a look maybe at a couple starters, and then I'll really get into the bullpen because that's where you're going to see some big differences between a sabermetric setup versus sort of a, a traditional setup with the bullpen. Um, Edinson Bulquez, uh, he is kind of our, our number one guy here, and it's really just because he's got some decent stamina. But he did not have a good year last year. So if we look at traditional stats, right, his ERA 5.37. Let me slide over so you can see our own picture. Uh, 5.37. And he's pitching full seasons, right? 189, 200. He's, you know, he's pitching full years here these last four or five years. Um, but look at the whip. One point, he had a terrible year last year for the Royals, right? Really, really rough year. He started 34 games. That is a full slate of games. Um, 
but boy, let's let's take a look here. I mean, what like for instance between these two seasons, let's try to see what is going on. Like, why do you have such a different season? You almost pitched the same amount of innings, almost the same base on balls. You had a little bit more strikeouts, um, but again, you pitched a few more innings. But look at this, the ERA was so much different, right? The WHIP was lower. Started almost the same amount of games. So let's continue on and try to look and see. And I have not scripted any of this. This is literally just, we're just going to go through and see. Maybe there is a difference. Maybe there is not. Um, you did give up a few more home runs and less innings. So again, but it, you know, some of that's just luck. Faced better hitters, certain games, things like that. You can see the difference in war, right, based on stats. I have same amount of innings pitch, but he almost doubled his war. K's per nine. Now, this is a really important saver metric stat. This is probably one of the most important pitcher stats that uh, uh, your modern general manager is looking at today, uh, your K through nine, K per nine. Uh, for a starter, 6.6, .6, not bad. Um, usually looking for guys around that seven mark, uh, ideally. Uh, certainly more is nice, but not everybody. You know, certain guys aren't going to strike out even six. Uh, but it really also comes down to this stat that goes with it, which is the base on balls per nine, right? At a minimum, you're, you're wanting your starter to be at a two-to-one ratio, and that's at a minimum, in my opinion. Um, you're going to have guys, uh, your top-of-the-line top, top of the line starters, Justin Verlander, Kershaw, they're going to be way above two-to-one, um, three-to-one, sometimes as high as like seven or eight-to-one, sometimes ten-to-one for some guys. And didn't Arietta, I think last year, had like a ten-to-one strikeout-to-walk ratio? Um, don't quote me on that. But So anyway, you can see he's he is not even at two-to-one, so that's one of the struggles there. Uh, he was probably walking a few too many guys, and you can see that number was slightly lower in 2015 with the Royals. Um, home runs per nine inning is another stat. Uh, you, you probably want a starter that's going to be below that one. Uh, the major league average for home runs in a game per team is 0.8. Uh, so if you can get a pitcher who is below that, of course, they're going to be an above average pitcher at preventing home runs, you could say. If they're at 1.0 or higher, they're struggling, right? They're, they're, they probably don't have a ton of movement on their balls. Uh, players are, are squaring up the ball, and, and, they're, and they're getting hits and things like that. So uh, and they're hitting the ball hard, and, of course, a lot of times that's going to lead to home runs. So really, uh, there's a combination of that going on. It looks like he just got – maybe he's losing some movement on his pitches, um, and that was even uh, – you know because of this, he's getting hit harder. Maybe he is uh, just being a little more cautious and walking more batters because – uh, 3.61, it's not his career high by any means. You can look at his career numbers at the bottom in yellow, right? Uh, and really, he actually had a more efficient year as far as walks go for him. Uh, again, three isn't terrible. Anything in the threes isn't awful. It's when you start getting above that. Um, 3.61, I wouldn't say is good, but it's it's probably slightly below average. Um, so, but look at his career K per nine, right? 8.6. I mean, he has regressed a lot since 2012. I mean, almost every year he's regressed uh, in his K numbers. So again, uh, he's he's losing something on his pitches. I, I think it's safe to say, right? Uh, maybe his, if he actually throws a primary sinker in real life, uh, maybe that ball is not getting the sink it once did. So um, that's had an effect, right? So anyway, saver metrics, right? They're not looking at stats like ERA. They're looking at actual measurables. And, and the, one of the reasons they really look at these three stats, probably more than anything, these are the three things a pitcher can prevent. They don't require defense. They don't require the, the necessarily a little bit the size of the stadium. It is the pitcher versus the batter. And you can make an argument that the catcher and umpire is mixed in there as well. But ideally, these are the three things a pitcher can control. It's also one of the weird reasons why in actual games, I've been told, uh, I think Millennium even verified this with uh, the Sony or, uh, San Diego uh, Studios team, home run per nine in played games for pitchers does not matter. It has no effect. The rating does nothing. It sounds like really the only ratings that really matter for pitchers, unfortunately, are the hit per nine and K per nine, which is really weird because we just talked about how hitchers, hitters don't really control hits all that much. I'll cover that in a, in a little bit when I talk about uh, compo uh, component ERA. However, um, it, the home runs per nine is, is – there's some arguments to be made. Maybe that should count. And then you could say, well, wait a second. Why don't we just use the hitters? Uh, what's it really matter? We don't have splits. We don't have split ratings for pitchers because we have it for hitters. And, again, I, I think there should be there. I, I actually strongly think you should have splits uh, for pitchers and hitters. I was kind of shocked it's not in the game this year. But – 
for uh, home runs per nine, we have the rating there, but it, it doesn't seem to do anything. Like it, it just doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't register apparently in plate games. I guess in simulated games it does, but it does not, as far as I was told, for um, played at games when you're actually playing the game with the pitcher. So, anywho, uh, continuing to look at his stats because there was another that I want to look at. By the way, another traditional stat that people are really obsessed over, of course, are wins. Uh, case in point, baseball writers, right? If, if I say baseball writer, and I say, just think of a baseball writer, not an actual like writer maybe you follow, but if I if I had you explain to someone who's from another country who doesn't know what baseball is, who what does a baseball writer look like? What, how old are they? That sort of thing. Uh, especially, the like, point I'm trying to get at is how old they are. Most baseball writers are older guys, right? They've been writing for a while, and uh, these are the guys who vote on things like like the Cy Young Award. So if we go in and look at a couple teams here, let's go in and look at Rick Porcello, who actually won the Cy Young last year, right? This is the season right here. Rick Porcello, he won the Cy Young. He had an ERA of 3.15. He struck out 189 guys. Only walked 32. Had a real nice low whip. Uh, let's look at these zero metric stats we just looked at. So again, look at that ratio, right? That's like a 7 to 1. That's awesome. So super good. Home runs per 9. Not great, right? But he does play in a, in a home run kind of happy park there in, in Fenway. So, um, And I'm going to get to these two stats in just a little bit. But um, okay, so again, he had a good year. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. I mean, those are some the 7 to 1s are a great ratio. And he won 22 games. He went 22 and 4, right? 22 and 4. That is super impressive. But sabermetrics will tell you that the most useless stat, really, of all, other than maybe saves, is wins by a pitcher. Because a pitcher, of course, doesn't just win the game. There's a team of 25 people and, and a manager and field crew and all these people who work for the team who contribute, uh, you know, the different coaches and, and uh, you know, base coaches and the trainers and uh, all the other staff that will contribute in some way, shape, or form, big or small, to a team winning. So to give just the pitcher a win... It seems kind of odd, right? But Rick Porcello won the Cy Young. Now, if we look at who came runner-up, he was on my Detroit Tigers. We look at Justin Verlander. Now, he only went 16-9, and nine, right? So 22-4 and four is a much better record. There's, there's no question there. But if we just said that wins are useless for a pitcher, so are losses, right? It really doesn't mean anything. So innings pitched, just about the same. Look at the strikeouts. 254 strikeouts in 227 innings pitch. 3.04 ERA, which again, we're not really looking at ERA because it's a stat that requires your defense. It takes into account your defense and a lot of other different things. His whip was lower. Folks, his strikeouts were more than one per inning, right? Uh, the walks, he had, a little, he, had few, he had more walks. Let's take a look at strikeout to walk ratio. So he was at kind of a 5-to-1 ratio. So uh, Porcello did have a better strikeout-to-walk ratio. Uh, he struck out more guys, but Verlander did walk more. Home runs per nine, also high. Right, uh, Comerica Park, believe it or not, has actually turned into more of a, a hitter's park uh, over the last three or four years. It's actually, for left-handed hitters, it's actually, last year, was it was the most, uh, it was the, the best hitter park uh, in the American League for left-handed hitters, So, uh, which, again, Verlander is facing. So anyway, uh interesting to see right the point being the whole point of this discussion when we look at traditional stats is one of the most important traditional stats for a pitcher is wins and and i firmly believe and a lot of other folks do too this is one of the reasons why we saw a uh, rick porcello who i have no issue with he was a former tiger I, I like rick porcello uh won the cy young over justin verlander in a year that really verlander had the better season uh if you're really looking at the stats that he can control and the stats that really matter uh, when you really kind of break down safer metrics. So while we're here, let's just keep we'll just keep looking at Verlander because there were some other stats I wanted to take a look at. These two stats here are are really interesting. Uh, FIP stands for fielding independent pitching, and it, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It, it basically means you know if you were to remove your defense and if you were only to, to grade a pitcher on the stats he can control, removing everyone else. Well, what would his ERA look like? Or ERA is probably not the right word. What would what we're familiar with as ERA 
look like, right? So 3.27, according to fielding independent pitching, his ERA was 3.04. So really, he actually got helped out by his defense a little bit because uh, Verlander, you could say, got a little bit lucky because, uh, you know, there's guys behind him making plays that maybe the average defender wouldn't have made, and that brought his ERA down. Um, so he was actually getting helped out by that. Um, now, that's one side of the argument. This next stat is really, really interesting because this is your, it's called component ERA. And I'm trying to think of the simplest way to explain a component ERA. But basically, it's very similar to fielding independent pitching, where it only measures what the pitcher can control. The difference, though, is that it does count hits. It is looking at hits and the pitcher's ability to limit hits. Because, you know, it, I guess in the simplest form, it, with FIP, uh, they say, well, uh, a pitcher can only control control walks, strikeouts, and home runs. But a home run's a hit, right? I mean, can't if a guy puts more movement on the pitch, can't he, you know, he, of course, he can limit home runs. That's the whole idea behind FIP and, and measuring home runs per nine and stats like that. But can't that same sort of movement also limit his ability to uh, suppress regular hits, doubles, singles, that sort of thing? I mean, isn't a ball that you know, is just struck weakly to your third baseman because you threw a nice slider. Isn't that better than, you know, hitting line drives all the time that, that could get through and if you don't have a really good shortstop or whatever. So that's what component ERA mentions or uh, measures. And and this was created by Bill James, kind of the, the godfather of Saber metrics, but this is one of his uh, more famous statistics, this component ERA, because it does take into account hits. So really, this is probably the truest measure of a pitcher's real worth for that particular season. 2.62 would he would be his ERA um, if it was just kind of him uh, and it sort of an expanded him, right? Because uh, we're including the hits now, not just these three things. And so 2.62, you can see that is a, a different measure than we see here in his traditional ERA. And, and is, is it minuscule? I mean, not really. It's almost a full run difference. So there's a, there's different stories to be told, right? So let's go back to Volquez. That's what we were talking about originally. And with Volquez... Well, I wanted to show you his ERA. So if you go back to his ERA, those last those two seasons we were looking at, right? We are like, oh boy, 5.37 versus 3.55. He had such a better year in 2015. Let's see if he did. And again, this is I didn't look at this ahead of time, um, so I don't know what we're going to see exactly. Well, yeah, it holds true, right? I mean, he was a better pitcher last year. I mean, both of these numbers hold true. Um, 3.61 versus 3.87. Let's see how much better. They're all pretty close, right? So actually, his ERA actually made him look a little better than he was. So, But see, here's the beauty of these stats, right? The GM for the Royals... Uh, Dayton Moore, right? I, I, maybe they could have looked at this and said, okay, 3.55 is a pretty good year for this guy. Not too bad, right? 3.55. But we're actually starting to see him trend away from that ERA a little bit. Could this be a sign that uh, he's starting to regress a little bit? Because look at this. These are horrible. Um, you can't see his career numbers. Uh, 4.08 for fielding independent. Uh, so I mean, just... He was even above, I mean, he just, he was really bad that year. And the ERA looked even worse. So really, the argument, the thing you can say here, at least for FIP, is that he's actually a better pitcher than it looked like. So really, he's probably in between these two seasons, right? Um, as he's getting older, he's probably not going to have a necessarily a season like this again, but he's not as bad as maybe this looked like. Although 5.59, the more accurate measure actually says, no, he is that bad, and actually he's probably a little bit worse. So again, interesting, right? Why would Miami uh, want to go out and sign a guy like this? Uh, and again, there's other arguments you can make for it. When he's starting pitching, uh, you know, they had the, the tragedy with Jose Fernandez. I mean, of course, they had to go and, and fill some roles. But um, it's interesting here that you, you would give a guy like this in MLB The Show 17 money, $11 million, right? over a couple of years. Now, I don't remember if they traded for him or, or if they just signed him or what, but uh, point being is, you know, boy, this is a guy, I hate to call him my ace, right? He's got, you know, he's, he has the highest rating on the team, 
uh, overall ratings, as a lot of you know, don't really hold up that well in this game because they measure a lot of stuff that just don't matter, uh, especially when you play out the games. Again, hits per nine, case per nine, stamina, those are really the, the big three. Velocity if you're playing a human, uh, things like that. But um, not all these ratings really matter. So overall, not a huge deal. Here's the guy I do really like. Um, I like Adam Conley when we look at his stats. Now, again, his ratings aren't all that great. Right? He's 26. But I, I do like some of the numbers I saw here. So he, he kind of passes the test of uh, the, the traditional <coughs> the traditional pitching measures, right? ERA, not bad, especially for a four starter. Eight and six, okay, whatever, went four and one. But again, we don't care about those stats, right? His whip was a little bit high. But let's go look at some of the saber metric stuff here. And again, both these seasons were pretty good. Um, this is a two to one, uh, just below a two to one ratio. Um, this was actually his better year, but the career numbers are, are definitely looking looking okay. Again, better than a two to one for uh, K's the walks, home runs per nine. He's kept it under one, so again, not great. And his fielding independent uh, pitching tells us that his ERA seemed pretty accurate, and his component ERA says well. Accurate, but take it with a grain of salt. He's probably not as good as you might be thinking, right? He could have, uh, he could maybe limit those hits a little bit more. So, um, but Adam Conley is, is a guy that looks like he could be a, a pretty nice player uh, for the Marlins here, being just 26. Certainly, when you look at his salary of only you know the league minimum in this game, uh, and so uh, just kind of again different different tales here of uh, a couple different starters. Now, bullpen, boy, bullpen's changed a lot in baseball over the last even 20, 30 years. Um, but really, when we're looking at traditional versus saber metrics, and I'll wrap this up here. This is kind of the last segment. I want to make it quicker for you. The, the closer, and this is probably not a huge surprise, but you know, traditional lineups or, or pitching staffs will tell you that your closer, it should, hey, this should be your best bullpen arm. Uh, this is the guy you want to come in and, and just seal the game. You want to... Have them come in the ninth inning and, and shut the door, right? Now, sabermetrics will tell you, though, while the ninth inning can certainly be stressful and it's, you know, when you're winning, I guess it is the most important inning to shut down. Is it always mathematically the most important inning? Let's use my lineup for an example. Let's say my team is losing. And let's go... We'll work backwards. Let's say it's now the ninth inning, and I'm losing, you know, four to three. And the next Martin Martin Prado is leading off that inning. Now they're going to have their closer in. It's going to be a pretty good matchup for them. You know, probably going to get the save. I'll probably pinch hit uh, for the eight hitter here. But really, he's facing our two worst hitters, and then a guy off the bench. Probably going to get the save. You know, four to five times at least, uh, if not more than that. So. Um, that's fine and dandy, but let's just say the next game now, it's 4-3, to three, and it's now the seventh inning. And first guy up walks. Let's say, same thing. Let's say Martin Prado walks. Let's say the pitcher, say a pinch hit, and he hits a double, right? And... So we got runners on second and third with nobody out, and we're trailing by one. Do you want your third or fourth best reliever coming in in that situation? Or do you want your best reliever coming in in that situation? And maybe that's exaggerated because you're thinking, like, well, whatever, even the best reliever is probably going to give up the tying run there. So let's make it a little less scary. Let's say top of the order, there's one out, and Real Muto hits a double. It's four to three, but now I got my two, three, and four hitters coming up. Do you want to bring in your closer or your best reliever, I should say? Or do you want to save him for the ninth inning when, you know, you might be facing these guys? Sabermetrics will tell you, you bring him into that situation, the tougher situation. It's the most important. That is the pivotal point of the game. That's when your best player should be there. Just when you're batting, you want your best player up in the most pivotal part. You want your best reliever, if your starter's not in there still, in that most pivotal part of the game, right? And we put more em emphasis on those late innings because, of course, you're not going to bring your closer in the second inning when your starter's pitching well and that sort of thing. But um, you want to conserve you know, energy from, for your bullpen and use your starter's energy. So 
But in those late innings, that's a huge thing. And folks, this is why we saw like Chapman uh, for the Cubs. I mean, he'd come in the seventh inning sometimes, right? He was getting what, like six, seven out saves and things like this uh, because they kind of, it was almost like a hybrid what the Cubs were doing. They're using it in, in both instances. They were saying, yeah, we want him to close out the game, but we don't want to just close out the game for three innings. We want to party all night and we want to close it out for seven innings or whatever. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, six or five or what. And, and he struggled here and there at, at times, but they won the World Series and he got the job done. So uh, that's really the biggest difference there. The other thing is that's, uh, and, and this is what, like the book Moneyball, for instance, talks a lot about. And then a lot of teams are now obviously using uh, Saber metrics. But back uh, when Oakland was really trying to do everything they could to sort of penny pinch their way to stay competitive in a really small market, they looked at closers as like really the best thing to try and sell because you're, it was kind of like snake oil. I mean, they're, they're selling something that just was just this fake statistic, right? Um, you're accumulating, oops, you're accumulating this stat that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Like AJ Ramos, right? Last two years, 40 saves, 32 saves. That's awesome. But what the hell does it really mean, right? Uh, he came in the last inning and got a one, two, three inning. So what, right? Or not even one, two, three, but he just, he came in and even if they had a three run lead, he just didn't give up more than three runs. Um, I mean, is that really a sign of huge success? I mean, Ramos is a very good pitcher. Um, if I go look at his metrics, you'll see, I mean, he's, he's very good. Um, a little wild last year, right? But, uh, you know, more than more than a two-to-one uh, K-to-walk ratio. But really what makes him stand out, look at his home run ratio last year especially, uh, 0.14. Year before that, 0.77. Year before that, 0.14. So, again, he's a nice guy to have in um, as, you know, to kind of end your game. But, again, if I am in the ninth inning, or let's do it this way. If it's the eighth inning, and let's say you have Ramos on your favorite team, that's not the Marlins. And I'm the Marlins, right? And you have Ramos there, and you have, like, your fourth best, third best reliever, whatever you want to call him. And let's just say the next two – my lineup right here is 3-4-5 coming through here. And you know you have a guy like Ramos, and it's the eighth inning. Then you're going, well, he's our closer. we got to save him for down here. It'll probably be, like, Ozuna, Hachavaria, Suzuki, or, you know, whatever. Whoever the pinch hitter would be for this pitcher. Um why would you not want to use Ramos against the home run hitter guys? The guy who's able to limit home runs. Uh, that's what his skill is. So uh, Saber Metrics will tell you, look at those matchups instead. Use your closer there and forget about saves. The only thing saves are good for is when you trade a guy like Ramos or somebody who accumulates this stupid stat that doesn't mean anything to another team that loves stats that don't mean anything. Uh, and this is where you, you know, we're seeing... Uh, a lot of teams starting to do this where they're kind of just breeding, uh, you know, producing closers when they started getting those arbitration years, selling them off. I mean, this is what Atlanta did with Kimbrell. Um, I mean, Jesus, you could go on and on and on. Um, I mean, geez, there's, there's a ton of, uh, of different examples of, of teams selling off closers and things like that. So, um, you know, in theory, it sounds nice. You can limit the game down to, you know, just eight innings if we have a really strong closer. And that's fine. But why do you have to limit the ninth inning? Why don't you limit the seventh or eighth inning? It still only gives your opponents eight innings, in, in according to that theory, to win. So, um, again, uh, bullpen will look at a lot of the same pitcher metrics. I really, really wish they had splits uh, in this game with statistics and ratings because with relievers especially, um, you know, I'm curious. Like, w what do these lefties, um, what would they be able to bring? Like, Jeff Locke is an interesting guy. This guy was a starter for most of his career, right? If I look at games and games starting, you see he's always starting. Last year, he started to mix it up a little bit with relieving. And I, I think this is the guy. We started to see some pretty big increases. Uh, no, it must not have been him. But there was another pitcher. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Maybe it was David Phelps. There was a pitcher on the Marlins, though, that primarily was a starter, and then they started relieving. Maybe it is him. See, he's a starter here. Started relieving. And look at look at that now. Look at his fielding independent ERA. Look at his component ERA. Look at the differences. Look at that dip. Look at the increase in Ks per nine. Right? He almost doubled it from the season before. But again, what does that mean without split stats? If he's only facing righties, that's a little bit skewed. I mean, relievers typically are going to have better metrics because they're used in very specific situations that almost always benefit the pitcher. Um, whereas a starter, of course, over the court, you know, they're facing an entire lineup that's been uh, to set up to 
basically break them down. And so you're always going to typically see, you know, pitchers uh, who've converted into relievers, uh, starters and relievers are going to start to see increases in their stats and productivity and things like that. But um, it would just be curious to see, I'd be curious to see, and I wish the game had these in here that we could see these split stats and that we could see, um, you get just sort of those, uh, those measures. We have them for hitters. You know, again, you can see lefty righty splits with power and contact. Um, but notice we don't have like vision or discipline splits. Um, why, right? I mean, if they're making better contact because of a certain handedness, wouldn't they have also be seeing the ball with their discipline and things like that and vision differently? It just seems a little bit limited and it's still shocking. I mean, flat out, folks, it really is shocking to me that there's not splits for pitchers in this game. Uh, I'm really hoping that comes to us soon because you can tell me all day long that, well, we can just base it off the hitters. So you're telling me every single pitcher would have the same results facing the same hitter? Then uh, that's just that's completely wrong. That's, that's faulty logic all the way through, uh, or else major league teams wouldn't be paying pitchers different salaries. So, um, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't hold water. So... Anyway, folks, again, this whole idea here is you're, a lot of you are starting your franchises right now. you got your rosters all set up, and now you're starting to think, well, like, how do I build my lineups? How do I build my staff? Hopefully this helped you. Uh, and again, this isn't a debate about what's better, traditional or sabermetrics. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would say, well, sabermetrics is because they, they can statistically prove it. Here's the other thing that sabermetrics can statistically prove, though. That a lineup doesn't really mean diddly squat. Um, it, it means that roughly between like 5 and 15 runs per season. So, okay, yeah, you're looking at a couple more wins. and That is a big deal. Uh, you know, if a team misses the playoffs for one or two games, that could be the difference. But it's not something to lose sleep over, right? I mean, if you're running like, oh, I don't know if D. Gordon should be here or second. Oh, my gosh, this is the reason why we lost 40 more games and uh, we're 20 games below 500. It's not because of that. It has nothing to do with it. You know, if something like that would just be these players aren't very good or they are super good. So, again, take it with a grain of salt, um, whether you are looking to use a more traditional lineup. Because, hey, some people use throwback rosters, right? Um, if you're using a traditional lineup or if you're using more of a safer metrics lineup, hopefully this helped. Uh, and it, it also helped show you, hopefully, some of the statistics that the game has in there uh, with some of the expanded safer metric stats and, and things like that. And Again, really, the, the, the whole purpose here is just to, to help you understand the game more so you can get more enjoyment out of the game. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you win a lot of games and uh, report back and let me know how you did. But, anyway, this is uh, just one of many videos you'll see on MLB The Show 17 and, and future uh, versions of the game from me. So, if you like what you saw, hit subscribe on the YouTube channel there and it'll ping you next time I'm uh, streaming something. Uh on Twitter, I'm Mike Lowe, underscore OS. You'll see me on Operation Sports as well. Uh, where I think this will be posted probably on Monday, it sounds like. And then, um, yeah, I got my sliders up there and things like that. So I'm always looking to contribute to the community. And I, I always appreciate all the feedback I'm getting from everybody as well. So hopefully this was helpful for you. Again, thanks so much, everybody. Enjoy the games. Enjoy the uh, official opening day now that we have our Operation Sports full miners rosters. And good luck to you in franchise mode.